Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. A lot of um, entrepreneurs get caught up in the shame of not being able to do all the things all the time. Mm. And, uh, and so that leads them down a dark place where uh, you know business isn't working, the money's not coming in, yet they're doing everything and that's still not enough to you know stop the slide so um yeah so that that's something that i think everybody needs to in business needs to acknowledge um whether they I, and i'll be honest i think for right up until maybe the last 10 or 15 years i would have been far better off not having owned a business uh, i would have been better off working for somebody and Why? uh and it would have earned a lot more money but i wouldn't have had anywhere near the same level of growth and I wouldn't mm. be where I'm at today in terms of how I feel about myself and the and, and the world around me and the people around me either. But nonetheless, you know, there's a, some people have just got to work out: are they really cut out for business? And uh, and if not, you know, they if they're good at what they do, they learn a lot of money doing it, regardless. Mm. So, um, so uh, yeah, especially small business is tough. You know, there's, uh, you know, it it it's uh, it. it it makes you really consider, you know, especially when you've got a young family at home to the extent that those sacrifices are ultimately worth it. So, uh, and sometimes you, you can't always be confident that it, um, that the, those sacrifices are. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing for, for, for any, any, um, business person, um, young person in business in particular. What type of sacrifices have you ever made for you or your family? Oh, I think, um, you know, the sacrifices that any man wants to make um, uh, are the, that time away from their family, but it's also the one that you regret the most. You know, mm. you, you need to, um, uh, for me, I think for many years, you know, there was uh, uh, the nature of my work is that it's, it, it has been a lot of evening work. Um, uh, that was the time running around with um, uh, contracts and agency agreements and that type of thing. And uh, so you can have that disconnect and not necessarily be there and as supportive of your family when when they're young and perhaps may may need it the most. Mm-hmm. Um, very fortunately, though, in recent times, you have been a technology such that a lot of that is now done electronically. And so, you know, I say uh, I now spend most of my evenings at home. Um, so, you know, uh, for, for young real estate agents in particular, um, uh, the revolution of uh, the use of DocuSign and, and other uh, um, other electronic platforms for executing contracts has has meant that uh, you know they now have a life with their family that perhaps they wouldn't have before. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. So but uh, uh, and and outside of that, I don't think you can have too many regrets apart from that of your family. You know, and 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 those things that you you hold dear. As long as you're making the most of the opportunities that are in front of you, I don't think you can be too upset at yourself. And occasionally, you've got to understand that maybe you won't, and that's just part of being human. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you you touched on briefly on family there. Talk about your your family now. We've got a beautiful picture of you and your family behind me. Yeah. Um, tell us so, a little uh, bit about your family life. Yeah, so we've got uh, uh, two children at home. So uh, Patrick, who's 24, and uh, Thomas, who turns 16 in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and uh, Helen, my wife, um, she's a remedial massage therapist. She did work with me in my in, in my business many years ago, and uh, we had a rent roll, and she ran that. And, uh, you know, we... we, we joke that it gave her cancer and uh but it's only half a joke it's very stressful property management mm. and uh so uh she left that and for um and at that point in time what was interesting she'd only ever really worked in clerical um uh, jobs and uh she uh she had no interest in physical fitness or anything like that she had gym, one of those people had gym memberships that just lapsed you know she never went she signed up she never went back and uh, had some intention, never really followed through. And then, uh, but after her cancer scare, she uh, became a personal trainer um, and, uh, and, and, a, and is now a remedial massage therapist. And in the meantime, she became an aquafit instructor. So, so, instructor. so she, she went from somebody who was never really physical and her experience in her cancer scare uh, led her to uh, uh, become quite the opposite and very mindful of her health and mm. and uh, and so it's uh, again you know that's one of those things that happens in life you can go in two ways and uh, some people are completely destroyed by something like that and it's understandable that they might be um, and other people will find it as an opportunity to change those aspects of their life that um, they know need changing and uh, um, Helen was conscious enough to, to realise that and uh, had the strength uh, within her to be able to apply herself to 
essentially turn her life on a 180 degree and and um, and uh, become this person that uh, was fully in control and responsible of her, her own physical self. Yeah. How, how old was Helen when she got the cancer uh, care? Uh, that she would have been 40, 44, I think, 44, 45. And how maybe. old were the children at that point? Uh, so this would have been about eight years ago. Yeah. Can I ask seven, how, seven what was years the- ago. What was the cancer scare, if I can ask? Uh, so it was breast cancer. And, uh, yeah, very fortunately for, for Helen, she didn't need any chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but she did ha- have a mastectomy. And and so uh, naturally, you know, that's that's very traumatic and uh, and difficult. And really the ever-present threat that it can reemerge, and, and that's something that uh, really women live with for, or any cancer sufferer can live with for a very long time. And they kind of draw the line at five years, which, you know, we're past that point now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, a, um, I think, a checkups next week, um, which is the first one out of the hospital system. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, it, you know, as you're coming closer to that checkup, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it always turns your mind to it and uh, it makes you very appreciative that, um, you know, for for those, that extra time that we've had. So, and, and, I mean, you you seem like a, a well-driven person and motivated, um, positive mindset, but how did you react to uh, finding out the diagnosis? Um, so for, for Helen, um, it, well, I think it's, it wasn't particularly my role to be overly emotional about it in the moment. It's really about being, uh, you, you really have to be supportive. You know, that that's and, the most yeah. uh, vulnerable moment for somebody hearing you, the news that, you know, their, maybe their time on this planet is going to draw nearer than what they ever thought. And, uh mm-hmm. And there's so, and and it's a, a myriad of things. So the worst thing I think a man can do in that situation is to be emotional. Um, that that's the time that you need to kind of put yourself aside from it a little bit and just understand that everybody else around you is going to be, and for a little while you just got to put it off, you know. And uh, and I think as a result of that, it gives you more time to actually digest it. I don't subscribe entirely to the uh, idea that it, it it you know at some point it just explodes and you're going to react. Um, if if you handle these things in perfect ways and or in the best ways that you know, you, there's no need to necessarily react to it. It's just a matter of sorting through it. So um, understanding that. You know, it might be seven, eight. You might never get the opportunity to emotionally release from it, especially if your if your partner is, doesn't recover. You know, and and it's a longer road ahead for you, or or um, in your struggle. So, uh, so you know, you've just got to work work through that and and to uh, understand that you've got time to digest it. Nothing happens quickly with those things. You know, so yeah, and and. This is, I don't mean this to be a silly question, but I do want the viewers to take pieces from all of my guests of how they, how they do things, because if they go through something similar or are or have, um, but my next question is how did you, 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 you mentioned about the emotions being put to the side for yourself personally, but how did you put yourself in a position to support Helen and the children? How did you physically do that? If, if that makes any sense? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> So we all have high, we all have sub personalities, and some of the, some of them are more highly developed than others. So, in other words, you know, when when you're down the pub with your with your mates, you 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 probably talk differently than when you're sitting having a cup of tea with your nan on Sunday. Yeah. Um. So it doesn't mean that you've got split personality or dissociative personality no. disorder or anything like that. It, it doesn't mean you're mad. It just means that you 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 have a, a different sub personality that you engage when when you're with nan than when you're with your mates. And um. So it's important to be able to develop a sub personality in the that of resilience if you don't already have one. Mm. Um, or to use those 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 moments of tragedy or difficulty in your life as an opportunity to develop that that sub personality of resist uh, resilience, um, because if you if you're a pillar in your family and if you're a mother or a father you are definitely a pillar in your grandparent if you're somebody that children are looking up to then it is incumbent upon you to uh, behave in the very best possible way that you can. And that doesn't 
and, and, and in my case, that meant not reacting in an overly emotional way, but being 100% supportive and giving people the space around you to react emotionally if they need to mm-hmm. and, and to be there. So um, that's, that's, uh, so I developed that, that sub-personality of, res- of resilience around me and, uh, uh, and that served me well outside of uh, th- that situation, of course, you know, so that's, that's something that you take away. But the, um, uh, the, the more that you're able to um, um, develop that, the, um, the better the outcome will be for everybody around you as well, not just yeah. for yourself. How, where do you think that mentality came from? How did you develop that? Because no one can be prepared for something like that, right? So where do you think that mentality came from? Because that's, I mean, yeah. it's fantastic, but it's easier said than done sometimes. Yeah, I was lucky to have a, a mentor, um, Michael Rowland, um, who um, uh, back in the 90s was a big personal uh, development guru in Australia. And uh, uh, many, many years ago, um, nearly 30 years ago now, I went along to one of his seminars with a friend of mine and uh, that that led to us uh, uh, being um, uh, influenced by him most definitely and then m- many years later becoming friendly with him uh, through uh, through other projects and uh, and then ultimately um, being lucky enough to uh, be uh, mentored by him and uh, and th- through that experience of uh, understanding that there are appropriate ways of being able to uh, deal with these things uh, uh, that on, on every level, developing those sub-personalities is very, very important. You know, mm. you've got a controlling personality, uh, that's who you are, that might, uh, uh, for instance, uh, that might be that thing that's the big driver that says, look, I'm going to achieve this, I'm going to uh, have that home, I'm going to have those figures on my books, I'm going to be drive that car, that might be, if you're that type of orientated person, I'm just saying that to be typical, but mm. that might be... Um, then you need to, that's your controlling personality, your sub-personalities need to develop around that. Mm. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, if your sub-personalities are otherwise, you know, lazy, inattentive, um, uh, cantankerous, then uh, all of a sudden, you know, there's no way that your, your, your controlling personality is ever going to achieve its goals. You're just going to be eternally frustrated with yourself. Mm. Um, so uh, understanding what your overall direction is. And so as a family man, that's a, uh, a loving, cohesive family environment in a time of need. Mm. And so uh, developing a, a sub-personality. At that point in time, I did not want to, uh, and it wouldn't have been advantageous for anybody, to develop a um, an, a, an overly emotional, emotive kind of sub-personality all of a sudden. Yeah. Be that person that's crying and, 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 and wanting other people's sympathy and draining people's empathetic energy because there was somebody else in the family that needed that if, if, if they needed that if anyone, uh, yeah. so so um so you don't want to do that so you develop one of resilience and it's it's not blocking things out it's a, it's a simply a way of working through things in in the in the very best way possible that uh, your um, internal structures permit yeah you know, you bring up some good points because my my mum was diagnosed with cancer. She's past the five year period. She's you know she's period. Sorry, she was she's back in Manchester. And I remember the day she told me I was here and I was in another part of Melbourne. And I do remember. I'm I'm sorry if she if she does watch this, but she asked me. It was something along the lines of, "You're not upset, or why are you not upset, or are you upset?" And I always found it weird that she asked me that, but at the same time, not. But I think I agree. I can I can see where you're coming from completely because I didn't get upset. Inside, it was shocking. My mother's just told me she's had got cancer, of course. But I didn't I didn't get upset. And I think I was still, I can't remember how old I was. Maybe thirty two at the time, eight years ago, something like that. But I think I did what you did. I think I was trying to be this person who the line of support for her, strength, positivity. Um, I mean, she was one of, she'd been the most, po- during the cancer period, she was actually probably the, the most positive she's ever been. And that's probably how and why she got through it, maybe. I don't know. Uh, she did go through the chemo and did went through the other procedures that you mentioned um, as well. And she was the most positive from it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just held, I, I, I stood strong. And because she said it, I questioned it. Why did I not get upset? 
am I, you know, cold hearted? Do I not care? I did. I went through all of those processes, right? But I, I, I I'm glad because I've just taken something from you. I've just learned something from you. And I think that's where I stood. I stood strong subconsciously and I felt she needed just that, that voice, that, that ear, sorry, to, for her to voice too. You know what I mean? Rather than reacting and coming back going, it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. I mean, I was saying it was okay, of course, because it was felt the right thing to do. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You, just, you just hit me then. It's a, it's a little like, you know, you don't, uh, if you're, if you're heading in a direction in life and, and, and you do get a hit, it's something like that comes up. Mm. The, the, the worst thing you want to portray to everybody around you is that we're no longer going this direction. It, the, the hope of still going forward needs to be strong. It needs to be great. It needs to be that, that momentum that, that pulls you forward. It needs to be that wake that, that sucks you along. It mm. needs to be that thing that keeps you thinking about tomorrow and the next day. And um, so emotionally reacting, making somebody feel like it's the end of the world for them is almost the worst thing that you can do. You know? Agreed, yeah. So uh, um, uh, having that faith that there's a, you know, a, a, the sun rises and there's another day is really what keeps us all going. Yeah, absolutely. Moments. And, yeah, no, I completely agree, Dave. And, you know, I think, um, I, well, I've been listening to another, I listened to another podcast, Stephen Bartlett, Diary of the CEO. I don't, he's actually the author of, this book here, The Diary of the CEO, and I went to see him last Friday, funny enough, and he brings up in one of his episodes around the three, you, you, um, how did you word it now about the three, about the different faces, egos, subpersonalities, subpersonalities that's right. He doesn't use that word. I forgot what he used, but he's like the three lives. You've got a public life, a private life and a secret life. And the secret life would be, you know, only, you know, your dark secrets, whether it's good or bad. Mm. Um, and you really know how you're thinking because you're the only one in your own mind, you know, thinking about mm. your thinking. And then you've got the uh, the 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 private life where only your partner knows you mm. right even to a certain point your children know you but your wife or your partner on a higher level um mm. husband whoever it may be um knows you on a private level um mm. your children won't know you at the same level of, of as your partner but just closer than anybody else i suppose but then you've got the public life where everybody else sees you like you mentioned the example down at the pub y your wife will see you in a different you know in a different light to that even mm. If I was to ask your wife, Helen, how Dave looked in that time of need, what do you think she'd respond to you, respond to me and say right now? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I would think that, um, I, I would hope that she would just felt, um, looked in terms of physically looked or reacted. Uh, or? Sorry, that I suppose that private section of the life that I was mentioned, not the public or the secret, only you yeah. know the secret, only everybody else. Maybe it's a tough question. Maybe I'm asking you to open up there. Um, but yeah, how do you think Helen would say to me that, that Dave is, is in his private moment? I suppose I'm asking you to share how Dave is at home in, in that dire need. And maybe you've touched on it a lot. I don't know. I yeah. suppose... I'm not. I'm not a crier, so I, I don't think my wife's ever seen me cry. Mm. Um, so uh, it, it's not. Um, you know, I, I I don't really have need to. You know, yeah. it, and and I, I I'm um, it, so I think in those moments is maybe I'm I'm a good person for those moments. Yeah, um, sounds uh, like it. <laughs> so um, yeah, I look, and you get you get those people that are really good at looking after people at the end of their lives, and those palliative nurses, and those mm. people they've they, they've got some God given thing that makes them good in those moments. So there's certainly moments in life that maybe I'm not um, uh, so so blessed with. Um, um, uh, with, with the attributes that that uh, that are desirable, but you know, in 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 that it was um, uh, perhaps you know uh, being more stoic was was appropriate. So I was lucky. Yeah. Well, I'm glad everything turned out well, um, and fingers crossed for next week as well when you go to your next you. appointment. Yeah. And um, do you do you think you have to prepare yourself mentally to do? On, on a daily basis to do what you do you know you know do you have a morning routine is there something you particularly do to have this mindset how to inspire your people on a day, daily basis and i don't know some of the other passions that you've got going on in your life that we'll get into but mm. do you set up yourself um mentally physically every day I, I used to have a really strict routine um so um for uh 
for about seven or eight years and, I, and I've slackened off a little bit with that over recent times um, mm. and you tend to find that you know, you have your ebbs and flows with a routine or a ritual or, or something of that nature and I think in part because you, you know you're always trying to work through that magic formula and and yeah. and, and, and work through that but I, I'm a, I am an early riser so I w- wake up naturally at 5 a.m um, I, I don't have an alarm um, I haven't for years, could be 25 or so, I've not had an alarm clock. Um, so I just get up um, and uh, it's it's always around that time. And then um, these days, um, I don't get up so readily. I might just lie around for a little bit, actually. So, uh, But, uh, you know, previously <laughs> I'd get straight up and uh, and, and do uh, the Tibetan rites of yoga and, and do some stretching, do something physical straight off the bat. And then um, uh, I, I like to actually just jump straight into work. So for me, it's, uh, you know, getting through any emails, and getting 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 rid of that clutter out of my inbox um, that might have, might have turned up overnight, uh, dealing with any little problems before they become problems. Um, and uh, and then um, uh, getting onto my social media for the day, and um, and doing that for myself and for AWE and uh, uh, and for some other things that I'm involved in, and then so uh, I get through all of that stuff, and then I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a little gym at home, so I'll get out and do a workout, and and uh, and then you know I'm ready for the day, you know. So uh, um, it's uh, the morning having a good morning routine really does set you up beautifully. Um, I am a cold shower advocate, and one of those. Yeah, Me I'm too. A, I'm a, on the band bandwagon with all of that, do the Wim yeah. Hof breathing method and you know, all of that type of stuff. And nice. uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and, uh, and and under Michael's tutelage, she used to do a lot of chanting as well, which I found was great for mm. you know. Dig- I've heard. Yeah, just getting just those call and recall chants. You know, it doesn't mm. have to be complicated, but uh, just getting your energy up is is really what it's about. You know, you're you're operating on a on a on a, on a vibration on a frequency you know universe one one vibration you know Mm. so as close as you can get and you can tune yourself to the vibration that's bringing you what you want out of life then the better and uh, having a good morning routine is is really well i think it's critical you know i think getting up having a couple glasses of water getting moving and uh, all of that um uh, has a huge impact if you're sedentary when you're waking and you you know you're sitting up in your bed and you're mucking around on your phone for two hours before you you know roll into the shower and then go to work i, I can't see how you could ever really be performing at your best you know yeah. or, or be entirely even happy with yourself join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way don't forget to subscribe we'll see you then